those base pairs. The other interesting thing which is happening now, and I think this is really important for synthetic biology, is that the largest piece of synthetic DNA, so that's DNA that you can synthesize in a test tube, is rapidly increasing, as is the cost decreasing. So we have this confluence of the ability to synthesize DNA outside of a living system. Okay, so how do we design and construct biology? So that's what synthetic biology is trying to do. What, it, what is the basis of what we're trying to do? So this is a slightly complicated slide, but it's to illustrate the engineering aspect of synthetic biology. So what it's trying to illustrate is that we can use different, what these are called abstraction hierarchies. So at the bottom here, we have the DNA, and we consider these DNA as parts. Pieces of DNA are parts, biological parts that have function. And then we put these parts together in a particular order, and that will give rise to a particular function. And then we can build more complicated arrangements of these parts, which will give rise to devices and systems. So this is very engineering. Uh, and this is essentially the fundamental basis of mainstream synthetic biology. It's how do you build these different parts, how do you put them together, how you test them, how do you design them. So what I mean by DNA, so there's DNA, that's a sequence, uh, a random sequence, that's the four bases, the four letters of the genetic code, and as you string them together, that is a biological part, a piece of DNA that has a particular function. And there are different ways of introducing synthetic DNA into living systems. You can use a plasmid, which has been around for the last 30 years, or you can actually integrate this new synthetic DNA into the genome of the existing organism. So I think there's a little silly movie here showing there's the DNA going in. So the idea is we're designing uh, pieces of DNA that will create a function, and we're implanting that into a living organism, for example, E. coli bacteria, and that bacteria will perform some function for us. It might turn green if it detects a toxin, it might uh, stop moving in a particular direction, all sorts of things that you can design into this living system. So basically what synthetic biology is trying to do is trying to consider this wonderful genetic code that we have essentially as a programming language, the ability to sit on a computer and design new genetic programs. Now, the cells that we are mainly focusing on in, in, at the moment in synthetic biology is primarily bacterial cells. These are very simple cells, single cells. Uh, this is yeast. This is Bacillus subtilis. It's a harmless soil bacteria. This is E. coli, which is a standard laboratory organism. And to some extent, people are beginning to exploit mammalian cells. But most of the sort of application work is done in, in, in these uh, bacterial and uh, uh, yeast cells. So this is the vision. So this is, you probably see these Haynes car manuals around. So the vision is by 2050, who knows, we will have a complete understanding of all the parts, the DNA code, and everything that goes in to make yeast, E. coli, mammalian cells work. So this is kind of the underpinning vision of the field. This is a robot in our lab in the center in Imperial College. It's actually an automatic DNA part characterization robot. It's actually characterizing biological parts, pieces of those DNA, and, and we characterize those parts and we produce these data sheets. So now you're beginning to see the engineering approach to synthetic biology. This is a data sheet for a particular piece of DNA. It's called a promoter. And these are all the characteristics of that particular piece of DNA uh, shown in a kind of engineering way. And of course, this leads to part registry. So around the world, you can access them, you can go online, you can just type in any of these names and you will find a, a massive resource of biological parts, particularly on the registry of standard biological parts, uh, which is actually a more of a student registry, but these are more professional registries of biological parts. So we're considering the cell essentially as a sort of mini manufacturing unit. We want to, uh, in the application space, we want to engineer these cells in a predictable and robust way so that we can produce things like chemicals, biomaterials, biofuels, pharmaceuticals, other types of applications. And uh, this is sort of a, a very uh, exciting area, I think. Now, just two examples, and I've got one more slide, and that's it. This is a beautiful example of synthetic biology. This is Jay Kiesling, who's an amazing scientist over in Berkeley. Uh, and what Jay did is he wanted to make an anti-malarial compound called artemisinin, which is this chemical molecule here. Extremely complex. It comes from a plant, original plant uh, uh, source. Uh, you cannot really make enough of it. You have to harvest these plants and extract it out. And what Jay decided to do was engineer a bacteria that would take all of the genes necessary, shown as these arrows up here, 
And these genes are from different species. So there's some yeast genes, some plant genes, some bacterial genes. And he created a, a, a production pathway that allowed him to produce essentially the precursor to artemisinin, which is artemisinic acid. This is now a factory in Italy that's producing this molecule, artemisinin, uh, at scales that it's allowing uh, the market, if you like, of, for this particular antimalarial compound to be more regulated. This is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. This is a non-for-profit um, sort of um, application. Here's another interesting example, which I'm sure everyone's come across. This is Cynthia, supposedly the first synthetic cell. But what this work showed from Craig Venter, who is a, uh, a very interesting person, actually, um, is that uh, you could synthesize a whole genome for an organism in a test tube. You could put it in a cell, and the cell would start working with the synthetic genome. This is quite a major step because this opens up the opportunity of now sort of designing new genomes and ultimately designing new cells. So this is an extraordinarily important breakthrough. Of course, it created quite a lot of uh, kerfuffle. So where are we? So we're at this kind of uh, app stage, if you like. We're creating a lot of genetic circuits, a lot of pathways, a lot of devices. Uh, we're putting them in cells. We're testing them. We're, we're finding out if they work or not. And all of these companies now are essentially providing DNA synthesis services. These are where you can send your genetic design out on the internet, and you can get the DNA, physical DNA, back by FedEx. Uh, and it's a really interesting development. That's it. Massive resource of biological parts, particularly on the registry of standard biological parts, uh, which is actually a more of a student registry, but these are more professional registries of biological parts. So we're considering the cell essentially as a sort of mini manufacturing unit. We want to, uh, in the application space, we want to engineer these cells in a predictable and robust way so that we can produce things like chemicals, biomaterials, biofuels, pharmaceuticals, other types of applications. And uh, this is sort of a, a very uh, exciting area, I think. Now, just two examples, and I've got one more slide, and that's it. This is a beautiful example of synthetic biology. This is Jay Kiesling, who's an amazing scientist over in Berkeley. Uh, and what Jay did is he wanted to make an anti-malarial compound called artemisinin, which is this chemical molecule here. Extremely complex. It comes from a plant, original plant uh, uh, source. Uh, you cannot really make enough of it. You have to harvest these plants and extract it out. And what Jay decided to do was engineer a bacteria that would take all of the genes necessary, shown as these arrows up here, and these genes are from different species. So there's some yeast genes, some plant genes, some bacterial genes. And he created a, a, a production pathway that allowed him to produce essentially the precursor to artemisinin, which is artemisinic acid. This is now a factory in Italy that's producing this molecule, artemisinin, uh, at scales that it's allowing uh, the market, if you like, of, for this particular antimalarial compound to be more regulated. This is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. This is a non-for-profit um, sort of um, application. Here's another interesting example, which I'm sure everyone's come across. This is Cynthia, supposedly the first synthetic cell. But what this work showed from Craig Venter, who is a, uh, a very interesting person, actually, um, is that uh, you could synthesize a whole genome for an organism in a test tube. You could put it in a cell, and the cell would start working with the synthetic genome. This is quite a major step, because this opens up the opportunity of now sort of designing new genomes and ultimately designing new cells. So this is an extraordinarily important breakthrough. Of course, it created quite a lot of uh, kerfuffle. So where are we? So we're at this kind of uh, app stage, if you like. We're creating a lot of genetic circuits, a lot of pathways, a lot of devices. Uh, we're putting them in cells. We're testing them. We're, we're finding out if they work or not. And all of these companies now are essentially providing DNA synthesis services. These are where you can send your genetic design out on the internet, and you can get the DNA, physical DNA, back by FedEx. Uh, and it's a really interesting development. That's it. Thank you so much, Paul. So now everybody knows exactly what synthetic biology is all about. Uh, I am going to invite all of our curators to come up to the stage. I'd like to really um, maybe start with you, Daisy, as the lead curator of Grow Your Own, and um, ask you, well, first of all, 
there's some colored poo outside, which I believe you created. Why? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean that. I mean it brings. It introduces another theme in synthetic biology, which is the international genetically engineered machine competition, or IGEM, and that was one of my first ways into synthetic biology. And I mean, uh, Paul showed the parts registry, which is the registry of standard biological parts, which IGEM is a competition where students around the world are invited to submit new parts, to design parts, and submit them to this registry. And I was working with students at Cambridge University who were entering, and I was invited as a designer, an artist, to go and um, spend time with them in the lab. So I spent two weeks in the laboratory in Cambridge while they did a crash course in synthetic biology, because they all came from different disciplines, from um, engineering and uh, genetics. So for them, it was new, and this is how synthetic biology sort of spreads. It's an amazing pedagogical competition, but actually it's also the way that synthetic biology is going to lots of new universities around the world. So as a designer, I spent two weeks with them, with my collaborator, James King, we then were wondering, well, what, as designers, could we bring to the iGEM competition process? So the students decided they were going to design bacteria which produce different color pigments. And we wondered, well, this is a, a massive thing, you know, the, but it seems like a summer project, but actually it could have huge implications if they make it work. So we wanted to think about the groups and the services and the users rather than actually the applications, so rather the implications of what they were doing. And we ran a workshop with them where we got them to take different points in the, in the next century and actually think about how it might, um, what, you know, what kinds of effects it might have. So the suitcase of poo outside was the, the imagined um, sort of scenario in 2039 where you'd go to the supermarket, it would be standard behavior to buy a Yakult drink filled with E. coli bacteria, which would be engineered so they could detect the chemical signals of different diseases. And then if they detect something in your gut, they start producing the corresponding colored output. And we actually took that suitcase, the scatalog we called it, to iGEM, where this is probably one of the first times I met Paul, was presenting the suitcase, because we wanted to ask the scientists and engineers who are inventing synthetic biology, what is this actually going to look like? And how might it change our lives? So how might it change healthcare? And what, you know, what are the indirect consequences of, of a technology like this? And if a biological computer is something that looks like colored poo, is that something that we actually want? Rather than this quite abstract discussion of parts and devices, which is the engineering language around it, how will it actually affect us on an everyday level? Well, it's definitely not abstract. But can I ask you, um, <laughs> The concept of the whole show, can you just talk through yeah. that a little bit? Grow your own, life after nature. What, what, is, what is the core idea behind this? So grow your own sort of comes out of these kinds of questions. What, you know, what, how will synthetic biology affect our lives? And how, what does the design of biology actually mean for us as, as society, which includes science and the people who all of us will potentially consume the products of synthetic biology? So as, as a curatorial group, I think we wanted to have projects and works that actually show what synthetic biology is now. So there's things from the iGEM competition, like the banana bacteria, uh, which was engineered in 2006, and there's now um, an artist, Howard Boland, is working with it. So actually, that is a, an example, a real example of synthetic biology. It's a very simple example where a banana has, I'm not sure if I can flick through, I might have a picture. Yes, the banana bacteria. Um, uh, e. coli, which has had a gene knocked out and a new gene put in, so instead of smelling like E. coli, which smells a bit like... Uh, it's, yeah, um, it will smell of bananas. And that was, the students wanted to do something quite simple back in 2006 to improve their, their work life in the laboratory because their experiments stank. Um, and that's a way in. And this first room um, has projects like this as well, which then take biology into uh, synthetic biology and its um, societal kind of ramifications into a new space. So we wanted to have works where we're exploring the real technology, but also where it could go. Uh, so the first room, Grow Your Own Life, is actually looking at how the boundaries between designed objects and biological objects could collapse. Um, so ourselves being biological objects, we might actually become in indistinguishable from um, objects of, you know, of commerce and design. So this project, for example, um, 
is about a mouse that uh, has the characteristics of Elvis. Potentially, it's a speculative project, though, that's looking at existing commercial services that are available. So the artist um, bought a hair of uh, a hair that potentially belongs to Elvis off eBay. Whether one can trust a service like that and a genuine Elvis hair, I'm not sure. But um, and then so extrapolating from that, if you sent that hair to a gene sequencing laboratory, could you identify traits which made Elvis who he was? So things like propensity for addiction or um, obesity. But in, within science, you have model organisms. So like E. coli is a model organism, a mouse is a model organism, um, and there's services that exist that can help you design model organisms for your lab research. So Kobe sort of took this to the next logical step. Could you get a mouse which had Elvis's traits? Um, so if you were to order that, what would that mouse be like? And w what effect does uh, nurture then have? So the devices in the show um, actually set up those the, the lifestyle choices that Elvis made. So these are some of the works in this first room at the Ichromai that we talked about. Um, but we're looking at how then it goes beyond the scale of the human body. So this is um, synthetic biology is a futuristic um, architectural parasite in a way. So how would people actually embrace these technologies and how not only would it colonize our own bodies, but how potentially could it colonize our cities? Um, this is New Mumbai by Tobias Revel, which is a speculation, a fictional documentary about um, hacking of of life forms to actually improve people's lives, but in a very unexpected way. So this is in the slums of Mumbai. Um, I think there's, I don't know if anyone smelt this on the way through. Again, synthetic biology. Has anyone smelt the human cheese? So, yeah, a couple of yeah, brave So people. you should open the fridge and have a smell. <laughs> um, and what this project is really interesting because it's it, again showing this blurring of boundaries between ourselves and um, our things in a future of synthetic biology, but in a very um, present way. So. Biologist Christina Agapakis worked with smell provocateur Cecil Tolas to actually make tangible the human microbiome. So our own cells are outnumbered 10 to 1 by bacteria, and um, we actually rely on them to exist. They help digest our food, they send signals to our brains potentially to tell us what to eat even. And, um, Cecil and Christina decided the best way to challenge this conflict between this antibacterial world we live in where everyone is afraid of bacteria and this future that's being promised that's powered by bacteria would be to do the logical thing and make cheese out of um, people's body bacteria. So I unfortunately was in the way for the first batch. My armpit cheese um, was made, but the four cheeses did, here... Did you eat it? I have not eaten it. Christina has eaten her own mouth cheese and, and will actually... Cecil and Christina will be doing a residency in the lab um, in a few weeks' time and they will be eating their cheese and also running cheese-making workshops. Um, and then the, this room sort of takes it to quite an extreme point where we consider, would you give birth to a dolphin? Um, this idea that, in a way, we could actually use synthetic biology to really save the world. But what does, you know, how far would we go? So Ai Hazagawa is, is suggesting that we could um, sort of mediate against the consequences of overfishing and, and a rising population by giving our own bodies to synthetic biology. And here she, she suggests that the Maui's dolphin could become, um, could be, be something that we could incubate. Um, only, only some of the members of this room could incubate. Is it, isn't there also <laughs> a suggestion of eating the dolphin? Yeah, so that's the next step. That's the bit that I have trouble with. Uh, I think it's quite, I mean, it is a, it's a provocation. Um, would you, if you gave birth to this thing and it's a, it's a source of food and if we live in an overpopulated world, you know, would you care for it too much to eat it? Um, and then uh, Vincent Fournier is a photographer, again, going into this fictional space and he's imagining future organisms in this project, Post Natural History, where um, they're designed uh, to, to survive better in a, a world of um, climate change. And this uh, image is the rabbit that's more intelligent. It's got human traits, so the eye is slightly unsettling, but it's, it, he's presenting them in the style of um, sort of the cabinet of curiosity or taxidermy specimens to suggest this very aesthetic exploration of what, it, what synthetic biology could look like. And then all of this is against the backdrop of this community laboratory where we invite 
everyone to sort of take part in designing biology and understand and become more familiar with the tools. Because what Paul is describing is a technology that becomes much more accessible um, in theory so that people can actually get hands on and, and if biology is easier to engineer. So I'll just go qu in quickly through the second Tell us about Grow Your Own Society. society. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't put the slide back together. <laughs> um, so Grow Your Own Society is um, the second room where we're looking at the frameworks that sit around synthetic biology. So the political, legal, ethical, and ownership questions that this, this field sits in. Because you know, synthetic biology, as, you've, as Paul's introduction kind of explains, it's not just about doing science in the laboratory. It's about setting up a, a whole technology and the foundations of that. So the artists here are doing things from, this is Blighted by Kenning, where she's, um, Charlotte Jarvis is taking, uh, uh, so encoded the human rights declaration into DNA and then infected apples with this knowledge and then sent it to scientists and asked them to take, to get this message back out of the apples and actually offered uh, ask them to eat them as well. And um, this idea that, that pro scientific progress may be unstoppable is something that she's looking at in this work. David Benke's um, New Weatherman is looking at the activist in a future of synthetic biology. So the ecological activist from a Greenpeace-like organization, perhaps, but who uses synthetic biology as a protest tool, so actually flipping the kind of conventional norms. Um, I don't know if anyone went upstairs and saw the faces. This is Heather Dewey Hagborg's uh, Stranger Visions, where she's looking at how we may kind of, the kind of sequencing technologies that Paul's talking about, make it very much easier for us to understand people's information about people, but their biological information. So cigarette butts were, were uh, collected from around Dublin and strangers' DNA is basically sequenced out of that and seven key characteristics identified and then Heather has built face, facial reconstructions out of that information. So the idea that you're just throwing something away on the street actually has vital, important personal information and we, we're used to the conversation about digital privacy, but in this future, biological privacy may be something that we're much more careful about. It's fair to say that's not possible, right? Well, that's also an interesting part of it, is how, how what is, it? so, uh, Paul, can you tell us what, why is, butts away, don't worry, why is this um, not I, I don't agree, I think to some extent you can say that's possible. The I mean, seven you traits, know, the, the eye the colour, race, right? yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's a very difficult proposition, it's a very interesting publication. Yeah. I, I, I think it does both, so it shows why it's not yeah. possible, but also, yeah. maybe it, we can, it will be possible. Yeah. It will be possible. It will be possible. I think we should get into that yeah. in more detail, that's one of the Yes, we should. Do you want me to carry on going through them, or is this, um, well, I'll have to flick through, I can, skip to the next room. Yeah. Um, maybe we can keep them looping or something yeah. like that and then kind of pick them up okay. as, so as we go Let's pick up along. the final theme, which is yeah. grow your own machines, where we're looking at the metaphors used in synthetic biology. So the idea of a machine made out of biology and what, um, you know, how far does that analogy actually break down when it comes to biology? Because we were used, before machines had living components like horses pulled carts and oxen pulled plows, but in this, you know, maybe the last 150 years of mechanical invention has just been a blip, and we're going to go back to this, back to this idea that a machine has a living component. So those are the projects um, in that final room that sort of start to explore everything from bacteria, which produce materials and cellulose, through to machines that actually are printing life, um, and even bacteria as alchemists uh, making gold. I don't, we're getting 24 karat gold being um, secreted uh, by these bacteria out from the solution. So by the end of the show, science gallery will be rich. <laughs> by the end of the show, that piece will be missing from the gallery. <laughs> it's a very small piece of gold. Thank you, Daisy. So and I that, can we yeah. put these on a loop now? Yeah. Just speak so I, I guess um, this is obviously a, a fastly developing realm of research. Um, it's, things are happening really quickly, but you know, what what is the potential role for designers here? Maybe Tony, you could, uh, you know, what do designers bring to the conversation? We have uh, engineers, we have molecular biologists uh, uh, engaging with synthetic biology. Why do we need designers too? Um, lots of different reasons, but uh, <laughs> one I think is that um, you know experiments in genetics have been happening in labs for a, a long time, and it's almost from a design point of view, it's like at the level of prototypes, one-off and limited production. 
And if the um, promise of synthetic biology is fulfilled, one of the things that happens is a, a kind of increase in the scale of production. So genetic products, in a sense, might become mass or biotechnological products might be mass producible and enter everyday life, not just through um, medical channels, um, but also through the marketplace. And so consumerism kicks in. You start to have fashions and trends and desire and irrationality. And I think this is a space where, as designers, we're used to operating. We're used to translating technologies into things that um, appeal to people beyond functionality. But with something like this, there's obviously a lot more complex issues than um, a Walkman or, or, or a mobile phone. You're talking about things that are maybe semi-living or um, continue to evolve or mutate um, once they become products. So I think that um, rather than doing what we normally do as designers, um, plugging in at that stage and trying to turn them into products that are affordable and, and useful, but maybe um, kind of more, you know, in this case, difficult to predict what's going to happen to them, we can move upstage, upstream, uh, and start to look at stuff while it's still in the laboratory, and then fast forward into imaginary futures to create the kinds of products, um, this is a good example, or situations of possible futures for research and present them in very concrete forms in shows like this, where we can discuss and debate um, not only what kind of futures we do want, um, but also what kinds we don't want. And um, I think that as a designer, one of the things um, that's interesting is it creates new opportunities. On the one hand, we take on new roles, so we're not just solving problems or making things consumable, but we might become provocateurs where we ask what-if questions through design. Um, we need new context. Instead of only designing for uh, mass production in factories and consumption in shops, we have to think differently about how we design for exhibition spaces and other interfaces with um, different publics and audiences. And also, there are different ways of designing, different methods or approaches. I mean, in this case, we're dealing a lot with um, fictions and how we tread this fine line between, I guess, on the one hand, a hoax, where we're fooling people into believing something that's imaginary becomes real, to communicating that this is an imaginary proposition, like the um, giving birth to um, a dolphin project, for example, but making them convincing enough that people are prepared to invest in that proposition and entertain what it means. So I think um, I'd say the main thing that design can bring is a kind of sensitivity to people's hopes and desires and fears and um, anxiety, ir irrationalities and an ability to tangibilize these issues in things that speak the language of consumer products. So it's not like some abstraction or, or a piece of um, maybe quite abstract art, but it's in the form of the things that we're surrounded with and we can then have a debate about what kind of uh, features really we want from our technologies. But e even in the very short time that this exhibition has been open, people have been getting angry about the, the fact that they can't tell what's fiction, what's reality. You know. um, how do you respond to that? I think there's a few different things. There's, um, there's the media, say, is one mm. issue. When the work is reported, it's often reported in a way that mischievously plays up on that ambiguity to kind of create a provocation or to, if it's a website to attract hits and so on. So I think there needs to be a little bit more responsible um, reporting and coverage of this kind of stuff. I think audiences don't know how to read design sometimes that isn't practical. We're used to thinking of design being real, being functional. If we see something that looks realistic, it must be real. But over the last decade, um, this other form of design has been emerging that is more fictional and speculative. And I think that, I don't know how we can do this, but we need to communicate and broaden the way that people relate to conceptual designs or designs shown in environments like this. But I think as designers, we can do stuff too. We can design in a way that doesn't try to fool people by making things hyper-realistic, but sends out little subtle clues that maybe this isn't a real product, but it's, it's about a product. So I, I think really, we need to work on a number of different levels to make this kind of work work better. Mm. So you, you actually don't want it to be completely camouflaged as a, as a real product, uh, as a consumer product? I don't. I mean, yeah. some, many designers disagree with that. Mm. There are famous products like the um, ray skin fish yes. that was kind of circulating about a year or two ago. And I, for me, it's kind of cheating. It's too easy to just create a fake product and, mm. and create a big storm. And yes, it gets a debate going. Mm. So it's great from an activist point of view. 
But from a design point of view, I just think it, it's basically, it's kind of wrong. You're, you're basically tricking or fooling people. And I think it's more interesting to design in a way that invites people to make believe or to imagine or to suspend their disbelief. And that's where a kind of a skillfulness or a craft comes. But, but not all designers agree with that. And it depends what your motivation is. I mean, if it's to create a really striking provocation, then probably faking is good. But mm. if you want to enter into a kind of more knowing um, conversation, I, th I think it's better to communicate that these things are propositions and, and proposals rather than fully worked out ideas. But uh, Daisy, your e I, I mean, the, the actual bacterial part of that mm. was actually yeah. developed. I mean, it's not a question, it's not a fiction, it's a... I mean, so that exists, they didn't make it into detector. It, I mean, they produced uh, seven biobrick parts that produced, each one produces a different color pigment and some of those have been more successful. I think the violacin has been used quite widely to the purple one. Yeah, sure. But the, the, the colored poo aspect of it was entirely fictional. And, but what has been interesting is I spend a lot of time at synthetic biology mm. uh, conferences and I see that presented back to me by scientists saying, you know, well, maybe we should try and make this a reality or what are, you know, what are, what are the jumps that need to be, um, to be sort of uh, re uh, reached across to actually make it possible. I think I remember you giving mm. out that you originally made it as a kind of a provocation yeah. that like, you think science is going to be great, but it's going to be like this. And then the scientists were like, Good idea, yeah, let, let, let's do that. So yeah. For me, I mean, that's a really great example of what Tony's talking about with the fictions that, in a way, it's too close to reality. I mean, people mistake it for a, a, a real product. And it's also because the original, the reason it's in a suitcase is because we flew to iGEM and took it to those scientists. And it was the best way for us as designers mm -hmm. to actually infiltrate iGEM because that was very unusual at the time. Tricky um, going through the airport, though, with <laughs> yeah, hand I, luggage. I took it for the first time through hand luggage this summer, and it was quite embarrassing because I had two of them. <laughs> um, I want to come on to um, uh, Paul talked about the idea of uh, reprogrammable, the reprogrammable language of DNA. And you know, Craig Venter, who you mentioned, has also talked about you know, DNA, uh, life as a DNA software system. He actually said that here in Trinity College. Uh, I don't know if any of you are here last year uh, in June, there was a restaging of Erwin Schrodinger's 1943 What is Life lecture, which was given to the entire Irish cabinet and uh, to Eamon de Valera. And um, uh, Craig Venter in June actually did a sort of re a, a new updated version of What is Life. Um, and. This, this idea of life as being uh, something that is a, a, a DNA software system, life being like software. Um, and obviously, if life is software, then software can be hacked. Uh, and that brings in um, the DIY bio community, the idea of jailbreaking organisms, and the biohacker movement. And uh, Cahill, you are a self-described biohacker. Uh, what does that mean, exactly? Uh, right. So. I think that I, I like to use that word because it provokes that question straight away. And it kind of gets the, uh, it clears the air a bit when people immediately think you're going to hack their pacemaker and then you get to say, no, it's fine. I'm talking about the positive <laughs> sense. So uh, it's important for people who are unfamiliar with the term hacking to remember that, or to, to be informed that it was originally a term of respect among people who consider themselves hackers of computers before computers were ever ubiquitous. Not in the breaking into a, a system or harming a system or you know breaking into someone's email in the sense of like you know a guy who gets a computer working using a bit of twine you say oh that's a great hack mm -hmm. or who manages to get this really complex thing to happen using a single line of really terse impenetrable code and you say god that guy's some hacker i haven't a clue what he just did you know it was it was a term of respect for people who are able to do amazing things with very little and I think the identity of a hacker has actually kind of realized itself as not necessarily depending on computers over the last few decades. That may have been where the culture emerged, but the culture is about openness, uh, the ability to modify something, to play with it, to tinker and understand things by doing, and to provide that to other people, to disseminate the knowledge of complex systems and then invite other people to play with them. And that's what we call hacker culture or the hacker ethic. And the hacker ethic has gone into hardware, electronics, it's gone into politics, it's gone into big data and everything. And it was inevitable that people would say, you know, life is this amazing complex system. 
and we are asked to accept biologically derived products as given by large corporations or by governments and just not ask questions, just accept that it's safe, accept that it's, uh, it is done well enough and that there's nothing else that needs to be done here. And it's inevitable that people who subscribe to the hacker ethic would say, no, that's not good enough. Nothing is ever good enough. Something can always be made better. And you have a culture emerging that take all this equipment from, uh, from labs, take the protocols from labs and say, you guys are making it difficult because you can afford to. It's actually not necessary to, for this to be so costly, so difficult, and so impenetrable. You can do this using kitchen ingredients. You can do that using stuff you buy in the supermarket. Uh, engineering life should not be any more difficult than learning to program a computer, which is something anyone in this room can go home and learn to do online. So why not the same for living things? But that, that sounds really unlikely. Uh, I mean, just the idea that a really cutting edge area of research, which one would expect to require large labs and you know very expensive equipment, can be done you know in your backyard and you know with a couple of cheap bits of equipment. I mean, can you really claim that you can make a contribution to synthetic biology uh, in in that kind of environment and with cheap tools? Well, I like to think I'm already doing it. Yeah. Uh, so, I. I, I kind of feel the best way to answer these questions is rather than just reasoning about them, and this, is, this would be part of the hacker ethic as well, you know, doing is better than saying. So uh, a few years ago, I actually started assembling lab equipment together and either buying secondhand or building from kits or repurposing, you know, household equipment um, or designing from scratch where necessary to, to get all of the basic equipment you need from a microbiology lab. And once you've got the basic equipment, a lot of the other stuff, which you will see people using very special equipment to do, Often, if you really want to, you can do that yourself using you know, chemicals or ingredients you can find around the house. Like DNA extraction can be done using dishwasher detergent, salt, and uh, you know, the kind of alcohol you use to clean old tapes, or these days you get it for a surface sterilizer for your skin in a pharmacy. So you know, that's three common ingredients you can get in the local shops or pharmacy. If you want to, so you got DNA out, you can run PCR on that and take a human gene out, like Elvis's gene for music. And, uh, I mean, if you want, you can then put that back into bacteria using another few ingredients. So E. coli is everyone's favorite hackable bacteria. You can get your hacked gene back in using um, a common brand of over-the-counter laxative, polyethylene glycol, and uh, Epsom salts, which is sold as bath salts. So that's another two ingredients you buy in the local shop, and you can get DNA into cells. And everything in between, modifying the DNA, is done using the products of nature. So if you can produce your own enzymes at home and purify your own enzymes at home, you can modify the DNA you purify at home and copy the DNA you make at home and then put it into the cells you grow at home. There's no need for any outside agent to provide you with something you don't have. Life produces all the machinery needed to copy and modify life. It's been doing it since forever. So uh, I don't think there's any question about whether human agency can get involved without a huge budget. I mean, what are your key concerns about the future of synthetic biology and how, how it might evolve? A lot of people ask me what I think the worst case scenario for synthetic biology is, and I think we're already in it. I think that right now, the fact that you, ha you can divide genetically modified organisms that currently exist into two categories, those that are extremely controlled by patents, litigation, and government over-regulation. Um, so you have a situation where the only GMOs you're likely to see will never belong to you. You have no rights over them. As a consumer, you're expected to just be a consumer. Not a, not a person who actually interacts with the product. You wear it, you eat it, and that's it. If you try and grow it, we'll sue you. And then the other category is you, it never leaves the lab because of overregulation, because of this knee-jerk reaction. Anyone who isn't a gigantic corporation can never afford to actually bring a genetically modified thing to market. So you have people creating these non-commercial things they, they don't have a market. They, they, there's no way they could be commercialized, uh, often for environmental purposes. So a good example would be ash dieback has just appeared in Ireland. We are now expecting to see most of the ash trees in Ireland die, a mass extinction of a native tree. There are ways you can use genetic modification to create an ash that can resist that disease. And people have done that in countless cases when such mass extinctions are due to occur, and then they're never allowed to deploy it. Tough luck. Let the trees die. We don't care. And I think that means we are currently living in the worst case scenario for a technology which could be doing a great amount of good, but instead it's being turned entirely to profit. And partly that's because of a reaction to what people saw as commercializing. They said, well, we don't like this genetic thing. It's being done by big corporations. Regulate it. And the regulation has made, made it so that only the corporations can compete. I think we can only get better. Paul, are we living in the worst case scenario for synthetic biology? Um, well, I mean... <laughs> 
It's interesting listening to, to you talk about uh, this great big corporation out there, and I'm just trying to think who is <laughs> They're not just you know, one. Who, who are they? Am I? Am I it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, it's a sort of strange juxtaposition that, that your community puts itself in, and uh, it's interesting that the, the, bio, the DIY bio community essentially are a very welcome part of the growing iJAM, and in fact they're going to be DIY bio teams, I believe, in iGEM. So it's not as if there's a sort of, we don't want you people in, in, in this community. But it's kind of interesting that you put yourselves in a particular place uh, and you defend that rigorously. Uh, uh, and ultimately, what's going to happen, I'm afraid, is that you will eventually get subsumed into the mainstream because that's already beginning to happen. So in, in, in Seattle and in New York, they're setting up community labs. Uh, which will allow people to go and do experiments, which I think is absolutely fantastic, brilliant. In fact, you've got a little community lab out there. Um, and so, so why, why not do it in your back bedroom? Uh, um, you know, what's the difference between doing it in your back bedroom or your kitchen or your garage and doing it in a community lab? And I think that's dependent on different countries' regulations. So in the UK, uh, in, in, in the United Kingdom, you cannot do a genetic modified experiment in your kitchen. It's, a, it's illegal. You need to have a license to do it. If you go to a community lab, which has got the right license, the right training, the right regulations, the right environment, uh, where, where at least I think it, it can be carried out in a very safe, and I was going to say control, but that's the sort of, you guys will go, oh, no, control, control. You know, we don't want control. You know? and, and the trouble is, this is, this is genetically, this is genetic uh, information. This is life. Uh, and you know, you know, there is a reason to have genetic modification regulations. There is a reason to have you know, regulated environments that people do these experiments in. It's not because we want to stop people doing them. And I think what, what, you, what the DIY bio have brought up to the attention of people is that, you know, I don't want to be a university lecturer to do an experiment. I want to do an experiment, and I'm not, no, you know, I'm just an interested amateur citizen scientist. Why can't I do it? And I think that's an absolutely legitimate, uh, uh, legitimate cause. And I think everyone should be able to, to, to participate in, in science in any way whatsoever. But I just feel that there has to be a right model for this that allows uh, good practice and safety, basically. Um, so, you know. But it, I'm wondering also, um, you know, when nanotech, and we're actually in a building which is a nanotech research lab right now, um, when, when that kind of came out, uh, there was a really rapid rebranding of anybody working in material science. Suddenly they were all doing nanotechnology or nanoscience. Um, is synthetic biology just a, a rebranding of genetic engineering? Uh, no. <laughs> can you explain it's, exactly it's, why it's not? A yeah. tedious question. <laughs> I like and being it's tedious. It's so tedious, <laughs> yeah, really, it's so boring. It's, oh, okay, I'll, I'll try and answer it. Um, so, genetic engineering. Is there any engineering in genetic engineering? <laughs> Right. No, is the answer. <laughs> the, the name was coined, I don't know why, I think it was to give some legitimacy that we understand what we're doing when we're mucking around with genes and we're going to put engineering at the end of it and, that, and then the public will think, it's okay guys, you know, it's fine, they're engineers, they know what they're doing because we, we trust engineers, they build things, you know. There's no engineering in genetic engineering. So in synthetic biology, there's engineering, that's the whole, bo that's the difference. Mm. And I do get really tediously, <laughs> because, yeah. you, know, it, it's, it, you know, I tried to show that. This is an engineering science. It's trying to have a systematic approach to how you design biology, how you test it, how you characterize it, how you predict, how you do it robustly. And it's not sneaking around with a few genes somewhere. I was going to say in a kitchen, but. Yeah. So think, uh, apart from being asked tedious questions, what do you actually get out of being involved in a project like this as a curator? I mean, I, I, in, uh, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I'm very interested. You know, you're a scientist, you have a major research lab in Imperial College of London. Um, you know, why on earth would you uh, get involved in a show with artists, designers, uh, uh, and biohackers? Do you know what? I've been asking myself that question. <laughs> <laughs> what does no. it bring to you? I mean, no, it's, it's really important. I mean, uh, we, Tony and I have been collaborating for a number of years, uh, and along with Daisy as well, because it's really important that people, you know, sort of talk about this field and have an input into it. And, Everyone needs to know what's going on, and I think through the kind of thing that Tony presented, it's a one. This show that that Daisy and, and has really essentially, you know, um, put together uh, with our help is um, is really provocative in lots of ways, and it, it opens up people's thinking, it gets people into this whole field, and I think it's really important. So it's a sort of a communication tool. I, that's what I see. 
And what about this uh, perpetual debate that we even saw in your sort of venter uh, things of you know the scientists playing God? You know, what do you feel about that? I mean, is it you know, this cri critique that scientists should not play God? There's only and one scientist playing God, and that's Craig Venter. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of us are a little bit more humble and <laughs> have very small egos. I think it's funny that actually, even if you read the Bible, you'll find that most of the metaphor is about after creation itself. Everything else is humans. I mean, God gives dominion over nature to man. Uh, later on, you know, the quote upstairs, into your hands are they delivered, you know, God abdicates responsibility. And uh, I mean, there are parts in there like Laban and his sheep, where you have uh, this guy who's kind of passive aggressively given all the rubbish sheep by, uh, you know, by another person. <laughs> and he uses uh, a sort of a, a fictional form of engineering where he shows the sheep uh, white sticks while they're giving birth, I think, and they have white sheep, you know, lambs. Uh, you know, it, 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 it isn't true, but it's, uh, <laughs> you can't actually do that. Yeah. But like it, it was, it, the Bible has actually no problems with this, hmm. but we have this biblical metaphor of a wrathful God who doesn't like you messing with nature. Whereas the Bible actually makes it extremely clear that that's just what he told you to do. Here you go, go mad, I don't care. And like, I, I don't know where that comes from. I don't know where the playing God thing comes from. Well, it, you I know. don't understand, I mean, we've been playing with nature ever since humans existed. I mean, we've intervened continuously in nature. We've domesticated animals. We've destroyed environments. I mean, we've been doing nature engineering for a while, actually. And creating environments. And I mean, I, I find very interesting also the sort of hacking ourselves dimension of, of the show, which uh, where you have the you know the the work where you've got an electric eel, which is kind of turned into a sort of biological defibrillator. Um, how, how plausible are these kinds of scenarios? Plausible, but maybe not the best way of <laughs> solving the problem. Yeah, I think um, that was one of our students. Yeah. And um, I think she's very clear that she talked to scientists and surgeons and all that. It's not likely to happen. But she wanted to have a discussion about if, um, if, stuff, if 3D printing of organs is being experimented with in the labs at the moment to replace existing organs, could it be used to design new, yet to be defined organs that beyond her expertise? I wanted to open that space up, especially with scientists and funding bodies and the public. Think, should we be putting money into that or just in replacing organs? But um, it is very interesting. This, uh, yeah, you know, where you draw the line about plausibility and, and, and stuff like that. that it isn't always clear in the exhibits. So I think it would be great now to get some reactions, responses, questions from the audience. Um, so we got one question over here. We actually have somebody with a microphone, so if you, uh, they'll bring it down to you. Um. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna maybe reiterate a couple of the points that you already brought up before I get into my question, but um, uh, it's back to the biohacking thing. So like, I think at the moment, um, Bill Gates actually had a quote out saying that if he was in his early 20s or if he was like college graduate today or something, what he would get into is biohacking instead of computers. And it's often been related that um, we're at the age of computers where in the 70s and 80s where it was just the big companies had them and people were saying, well, why would I want a computer in my home? And it's slowly emerging. I won't go into the examples, but the home applications of what you could do for biohacking. And it's one thing to discuss the ethics and say, well, you know, we don't want people doing this in their homes and in their garages and their basements and what have you. but okay, there's right and wrong, and there's what's going to happen. And it's, it's, it's inevitable, like people are going to start doing it. And I think it's, what's really important that's being brought up the whole time is about the ethic and ethical control. But what I don't see happening is um, things like, you know, EPA approval needs to be cheaper, so it's easier for people to get to, more tightly regulated, so that instead of going, well, yeah, I'm not gonna leave it up to, you know, the big companies, I'm, I want to go at it myself. And uh, instead of doing it, you know, in Hyde, you can do it regulated. And I mean, the community um, the community lab spaces are a great step towards that. But I don't see any sort of, um, any individual school towards making, we'll say, model organisms so that, like, we'll say, if you had a remote kill switch, for example, you know, for stopping these things from getting out of hand. And uh, do, you, do any of you see, like, the emergence of that kind of field? Because that's something, um, that I would personally love to get into, into research myself. So, um, but I, I don't see any of that there, and I think there's a huge need for it. You as mean, uh, like kill switch controllable organisms? Well, it's something like that. I mean, it, just an individual um, research 
I don't know, school body for um, developing ways for making safer organisms because it's one thing to come up with all these ideas and they're great and then talk about the ethics, but why not have everyone come up with loads of ideas and have something there, some sort of safety, I don't know, group that, but, yeah? You know what, I mean, kill switches, do they even work? The idea that you could not, you know, something won't evolve beyond that. I mean, Paul, well, that, that was, you know, that was one I don't example, know, but it's but, a really, these are the kinds of questions like, really can active, you even get to this yeah, point? It's a really active part of research that people are working on. But, you know, the thing is that a kill switch gives immediate, the name itself suggests that it's a safety device that works, right? And, you know, we're dealing, I think it's a, a, a misunderstanding of the complexities of biological systems to think that such a kill switch can be engineered robustly, that every cell in a population of cells will act in the same way, because right. biology is not like that. Well, it was so, hi hypothetical, maybe yeah, a bad but example. I think, but I think there, this is where we need to get some reality checks, you know? So there's a lot of work going on about kill switches, about putting, you know, dependency so organisms can only live on a certain thing, and that's really yeah. good stuff, and it's proper. I hate to say it, it's been done in university laboratories. Sorry. Oh, no, I'm, uh, I'm all about you know, universities. I don't know, it's, it's properly funded research. Yeah. It's really yeah. important. But, but, uh, but well, I, what I was asking was, was sorry to go across, but... My actual question was, okay, because I, I'm not sure, that's why I'm asking. Is, Maybe you could just there, um, capture the question. Yeah, is, is there an independent body already that just deals with controlling any of these genetically engineered, we'll say, biological machines to stop them harming the environment? Because I, everyone obviously has to look after that on their own when they come up with something, but I haven't seen. I think that it's important to think, to realize that, you know, if you invite someone into a house who's never been in a house before, and they see a, a fire. Now their first thought is gonna be, why doesn't your house burn down? And like, you live in a house, you're an expert at living in a house, and you don't burn your house down, you know what you're doing. And I think by the time someone comes into this thinking, I'm gonna make this safe, I'm, I'm gonna fix all these problems, and you come into the field, and by the time you're in a position to do that, you also know that it's really not a big deal. You, you have enough knowledge to realize that actually, the fears you came into because you weren't familiar with this were unfounded now that you know more. And we have this big thing where we, we, re, we frame new things in the metaphors of our past or in the metaphors of our myths. And a lot of our myths are very dour. Like everything goes wrong and it explodes in your face and you, you turn to a block of salt or something. And the reality is a lot more optimistic that living things always invade and they seldom you know, actually have that much of an impact. Even the cane toad, after the wave front of the cane toad spread through um, uh, Australia, people are looking at it again and going, it looked like it was going to annihilate Australia itself, and now it's just another species. When it's introduced, it seems apocalyptic, and then once it's established within a few years, it has its own predators and diseases, it finds a niche, it's just part of the ecosystem. Unlike most the rhododendron in Killarney, where I'm from. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, like most of the weeds outside in Ireland, you, you think that these are natural organisms that have been here for eons, and then you discover that actually most of the virulent weeds were introduced here as agricultural species and then just abandoned. Most of our agriculture has now become our nature, and same for the animals, they were all introduced here. So this is what we regard as nature, but they were all invasive species once. I think similarly, some things will need to be controlled simply because of a human element. Like a, if you have a safflower producing insulin, you're gonna just digest it. But say thyroxine, say we try to replicate that for another essential human drug. Maybe you don't want agricultural species containing thyroxine. So fine, okay, control that. But you know that's a problem going in and you fix that. Broadly speaking, it's not an issue for most biological projects. You create a new thing and you just happen to know that this isn't as big a deal as people are worrying about. And that sounds very uh, hubri, I know, but... I personally think it sounds a bit arrogant, actually, yeah. because we don't understand biological systems to the level that you think. And I think, you know, I just... Uh, we're talking about microbial systems. I mean, you know, plants, okay, you can see them. Microbes, you can't really see. So if you're arguing that, you know, I'm going to release a whole bunch of microbes that's going to decontaminate some area, which is possible, uh, and they're all going to be safe and everything's fine. I don't think we can say that, no. Hmm. Well, I, really I mean, don't. I, I don't mean to release something that will deliberately become part of an ecosystem, but for example, this worry about BT corn was always that we'll get BT spreading into the wild and we'll end up with BT no, everywhere. No, sure, I understand. And, no, I understand the point. You know, we know the risks when we create the thing in that we know corn does not spread into mm. the wild normally. So adding just, BT just doesn't always change that. Just erring on caution, I think, and proper you know, consideration is really important for release. Most of the stuff that's going to be done in the future is going to be in contained big bio-producing reactors, uh, and 
you know, there is a slight, you know, containment element. And, but there are a lot of applications out there. It's the next big thing, you know, a lot of applications for release. And, of course, the European regulations on this is absolutely, it's, it's huge. I mean, to get anything approved through that, to release any organism, genetically engineered organism, it's I, nigh on impossible, actually. Um, do we have other questions from the audience? Yeah. Uh, you talk a lot about um, where it could be in the future and what's going on, but what state is it? What can you actually do now with the you know, with the with the technology? Well, in what setting? Well, I don't know. I'm I'm very new to this. I'm just you know I'm just curious now. I just saw that. Okay. Yeah. What, what products actually we can exist? Make biosense. A lot of, there's some biosensors that are being developed. We're developing two. I know Cambridge guys are developing one. That would so one biosensor that would detect arsenic in drinking water for a particular case in, in actually Nepal that, that where they're thinking about. So this would be a very simple kit. It's a biologically designed biosensor. It detects arsenic and it would change colour, and it would be something you could use in the field. And they've got some field trials uh, going on at the moment. So we're developing a biosensor against pathogenic biofilms, so, um, sort of bacteria that colonise surfaces. So we're developing a sensor that would allow to see those pathogen. So to change color again, simple, cheap. We're also developing a biosensor, I guess, schistosoma parasites, which are in waterborne uh, problem in sure. developing countries. So those are real things that are, they're not into the products yet, but they're going through this kind of what I would call the sort of translation phase. There are some product, uh, some biohackers working on a project to create a melamine detecting yogurt culture. Yeah. So in places where melamine contamination, which made the news a few years back, yeah. is, a, is a risk. Yeah. You could make a bit of yogurt out of your uh, batch of infant formula, if it turns blue, you don't give it to the baby. Yeah. So, you know, that's so very bi accessible. Yeah, biosensors are really low-hanging fruit. And then there's um, the Oxitec mosquitoes, which are on yes. trial. Yes, well, that's, on, that's, that's strange, because that's a transgenic mosquito that's mm -hmm. been released into the wild. Mm -hmm. Is in, that the um, one that's the Cayman Islands and yeah. in, is it in Brazil, are doing yeah. trials where they've engineered the mosquito, the, it's, not, it's called the RIDL mosquito, so that the uh, the males are engineered, and so when they mate with wild female mosquitoes, the pro they ha have no pro viable progeny. And those are actually being released in field trials. So that is a very interesting case where it has gone yeah. into um, field testing. But the idea is that it will s reduce um, dengue fever outbreaks. More questions from the audience? Yeah, back here. Um, th this is at the risk of missing my train in 10, ten minutes' time. but. Um, I the exhibition and the discussion so far um, seems to me not to have addressed what is perhaps the most fundamental synthetic biology, biogenesis, the creation of life uh, itself. Uh, even though Ventner likes to think he's come close to it, uh, I, I'd like to hear what your, your panel has to say about that. Anyone like to respond to? Well, I mean, in the um, in the final room upstairs, the um, where we're looking at the machines, there's a project um, by Oren Katz and um, Corey Van Seis, which is looking at protocell science, which is another aspect of synthetic biology, where uh, it's mostly biochemists are actually looking at the the core components and how you build life from the bottom up. So what Paul is talking about is also known as the top down approach. So sort of you know uh, taking apart things that already exist. And protocell science is really interesting because by mixing different chemicals together in theory, you could make life. But having spent time in a protocell laboratory, one of the key problems to me seems to be when do you know you've actually made life? And do you need a philosopher? And, and the scientists said, well, actually, this is, a, you know, if you, you could build a vesicle, which is a, a protocell, so uh, it could be a, a droplet of oil in another liquid, so it's, you know, it becomes well, that's, a cell. That's an point you can put DNA in, it's, the yeah. DNA could start to do something. Replicate, is yeah. it living? At, a, at what point? I mean, that is something that no one actually knows the answer to. I'm just going to say that living systems are, are made up of inanimate chemicals, you know, so, it's, you know, DNA is inanimate, mm. it's not living you know, in the definition of what life is. So it's quite interesting that mm. all these inanimate objects come together and create some living system. Well, you, um, don't, you don't even need to have chemicals that blur the boundary to have that problem, mm. because even if you look at just the natural organisms, well, natural, that, that exist, and we, we all agree are alive, mm. any definition of life that tries to encompass everything we agree is alive also invariably ends up 
uh, inadvertently collecting things that we generally agree aren't. So some forms of fire or plasma or crystals will always fit into your definition of life if it encompasses everything we agree as a life. Uh, even if you go down to the nitty-gritty, like a system that has uh, transiently reduced internal entropy. Actually, some types of fire uh, fill that definition. Mm. So it's almost impossible to define life just by looking at existing life, let alone mm. boundary blurring protocells or chemical structures. We'll so keep philosophers in work for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> But it's a really important theme in this show as well, is how do you, and as we start to put human desires and, and needs onto living things, more than we've ever done before, so it's more than just you know, breeding corn so that it's, it's bigger and juicier and grows in a hardier way, and it's actually starting to completely change the function of an organism. It could, that's what I find really interesting, is it could be a very, very small amount of genetic change, but the purpose of that organism has suddenly been willed into pure, purely human intention, so a bacteria that produces jet fuel. I'm interested in how it's classified. You know, is it still, is it still no. the original species, even? Or, or is it now a product? And as things start to sort of move on to patenting law, how do we, you know, do we need to rethink these kinds of ways that we describe living systems? Um, I think, I mean, hopefully those are some of the questions that come out of mm. these projects. <laughs> uh, I, I think we're all going to have to go to our train. Yeah. Um, it's been a wonderful discussion, uh, but I think we're going to have to close it there, unfortunately, uh, as we're out of time. Um, I would um, like to remind you that if, if we have a few copies of the catalogue here, which I think the curators might be willing to sign if they're very pressed. Uh, and um, I would like to thank you for participating in this conversation. Uh, obviously, it raises more questions than, than it answers, um, and I think even you know the the fact that amongst the panel there are you know there are different points of view about uh, uh, the synthetic biology and uh, its role in our world is is really important. Um, I'd really like to thank uh, our panelists Daisy Ginsberg, uh, Tony Dunn, Cahill Garvey, and Paul Fremont, uh, um, not only for tonight's conversation but also for bringing to life uh, this extraordinary exhibition, uh, which I hope you will all have the chance to uh, spend some time in and to ponder because there's there is lots of provocations there and lots of food for thought. So thank you all very much.